We're going to be talking a little bit about relationships today. It is Valentine's Day, and so I want to give you a few church pickup lines that you can use uh, that are going to help you in your relationships. You ready for this? These are church-approved pickup lines. Avery, be listening right here. Here you go. Take some notes. Is it hot in here, or is that just the Holy Spirit burning inside you? <laughs> Telling you, this is going to help you guys out. Here's, here's one for all the fellas out there. I put the stud in Bible study. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Is it a sin that you stole my heart? Oh, that guy, some of y'all, that one would have worked. That would have worked. You guys just look around for who just said, oh, look around for him. Is your name faith? Because you're the substance of things I've been hoping for. Hey. And then the last one, if you never heard this, you must have never been to youth camp before. I've been reading the book of Numbers, and it looks like I'm missing yours. Can I get it? Can I get your number? Come on. Can I get it? There you go. That's some pickup lines. Some of y'all, you didn't get nothing from church all year long, but you just got that. I saw some of you guys, you've never been taking notes any time in your whole life. You just pulled out, you would say, I better take this down. Pastor, he preaching today. I got some pickup lines. But, uh, man, I'm excited to talk about relationships and uh, what God has to say about relationships. And before we even start, I kind of want to just level the playing field and, and just say that I think we can all admit that we have made some mistakes in relationships. Can we just say that? Like, there are no people in here, I, no perfect people in here. I can tell you myself, I've made some serious mistakes in relationships. And so I just want to let you know, if you're like, hey, man, I'm the one that's messed up in here, all these perfect marriages, all these perfect couples, trust me, they ain't perfect. I did the marriage counseling, trust Trust me, uh, there are some, we, we got all kinds of people here at Oasis, and I, and I love Oasis because we have such a diversity of different types of people, and so I know a lot of times in churches, and especially at church, it can be all about the marriage. It can be all about like, hey, when you going to get married? When you going to get married? Hey, you're not married. Something wrong with you? And I just want to say that that's not how we want to be here at Oasis, and so if you are single, if you're dating, if you're married, if you're divorced, if you're widowed, if your relationship status is just, it's complicated, whatever it may be, I just want to say that you're welcome here, that you are loved here, that we believe that God has a purpose for your life, that you don't have to be married to belong here, that, that you, you fit here, you belong here. And so I, I want to share some stuff about relationships, but I think what we have to realize is that we get relationships wrong a lot of times, and unfortunately, the church gets relationships just as wrong as anybody else. Yeah. And so the church is supposed to be this place where people come for the answers. God, I'm, 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 I'm here. What am I supposed to do, pastor? How am I supposed to make this work? And it seems like we're just as messed up. We're just as twisted. We're just as broken. We have just as many broken marriages and relationships. And we gossip about each other because I'm not just talking about romantic relationships. We stab each other in the back. Our relationships are just as messed up as anybody else. And I don't want to act like I'm a, I'm a relationship expert today, but I just want to give you what God says about relationships. Because even though I don't have all the answers about relationships, I know that God has all the answers. That whatever you are going through in life, I may, know it may seem crazy coming from this ancient book. I know it may seem weird, but God has the answers for your situations. He has the purpose for your life. He wants to show you how you can operate and how you can live in his will. And so God has given us instructions for relationships, and this is what we've been talking about about basics, Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Now I preached about this several weeks ago. If you missed it, go back on our YouTube, our podcast, you can look it up. But essentially they are trying to trick Jesus and get him to say any one of the commandments. Excuse me, because if he says any one specific commandment, then they can trip him up, they can twist his words, and they can arrest him and remove him from his ministry. So this is what he says. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Does anybody remember us talking about that several weeks ago? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And we love this one. It's like, I love Jesus. I love Jesus so much. I'm worshiping. Hallelujah you praise God is great but that's the first one and there's another one and he says the second is like it so he's saying the second is actually just as important as the first one because see it's very easy for us to come in and do our church thing and do our Christian thing and say we love God but when it comes to other people we're like I don't like them like, I'm just, I'm pray, praise the Lord. Do not look at me. I will cut you. I do not, I do not like you. And I don't care that you know I don't like you. But, 
But God's saying it's just as important. This is what he says. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So we're talking about basic. We're in our basic series. Come on, you know what's coming. Look at somebody and say, you so basic. You so basic. It's basic. So we've been talking a lot about following Jesus. We've been talking about a lot being a disciple of Jesus and loving Jesus. And it, it makes me so happy as a pastor that we have people who are completely different spectrums of their faith journey that are both learning and receiving things during this basic series. I, I talked with Mimi, who's my grandma, uh, during the first service or after the first service, and she's been saved since Jesus was here. I'm pretty sure she was one of the original 12. Uh, she just didn't get mentioned. Uh, but she has been saved for a long time, and she was like, there are still things that I am learning and being reminded of in this basic series. But then on the flip side of that, we had a girl come last week, a young adult, who she has never been in a Christian church. She's never heard a sermon about Jesus in her life. Her family is of a different religion that is very anti-Christian, anti-Jesus, and she felt the love of God. She felt the love of Jesus in this place. She's been, she was back this Sunday. She wanted to come again. So we have people that are in complete different spectrums learning in this basic series. So we've been learning a lot about following Jesus, but what about that second part? What about loving others as ourself? And what I mentioned in the sermon before that I preached about loving God, and I was like, man, I can't, I can't wait to preach the second part of this, is I think one of the reasons that we can't love others is because we first don't love ourselves. How can you show love to someone else if you haven't received the love that God has for you? How can you show grace for someone else's faults if you haven't received grace for your own faults? How, how can you cover someone else's sin when you feel like your sin is exposed and so you want to expose their sin so that you are on both equal playing fields? So we have to receive this love from God, and this is the deal. We have to be complete in ourselves before we can start loving someone else. And we're talking about this idea of health in 2020. You're going to hear a lot about it. You're going to talk about, you're going to hear us talking about being emotionally healthy, being spiritually healthy, being relationally healthy, all these different things we are talking about, this idea of health. And I think one of the reasons our relationships are so unhealthy is because we're unhealthy. So we can't be in a relationship with someone and we can't expect that to go well when we're not even good on our own. Are you with me today? Come on, come on 12 o'clock service. So you have to love yourself before others. You have to understand that you are complete in Christ. That, that's the basic of today. You have to understand that Christ has already completed you, that you don't need another person to complete you, that you don't need another job to complete you, that you don't need anything else to complete you other than Jesus. But we've bought into this lie, and we've all heard it before. Look at somebody and say, you complete me. Come on, look at somebody else and say, you complete me. This is your chance, guys. I'm trying to help you out. Valentine's Day, I'm trying to help you out, guys. But we've all bought into this lie that we need someone else to complete us. Right. And we've, we've all heard it said before, and here's how prevalent it is in our culture. I've never even seen Jerry Maguire. And I know the movie that it's from. I know who says it. I know who the actor is. I know what he's wearing because it's just, you complete me. Like that's just, that, that's basically the, the, the ultimate height that we can reach in a relationship in America in 2020 is you complete me. <laughs> the issue though, is what you're saying is, is that I am not complete and I am missing something. So by saying someone else completes me, you are saying there's something wrong with me. There's a broken part of me. There's a fractured part of me. And so I need someone else to fill that void in my life. I need someone else to fill that hole in my life. When Jesus is saying, no, I want you to be complete on your own. And this myth didn't just start in the 90s or start in the 2000s. This actually goes back for thousands of years. It is an ancient story of creation. Here's how the story goes. That God created this being, and this being had two heads, four arms, four legs, and had both male and female reproductive systems. And then God decided that he was going to split that being in half and he was going to spend, uh, make them spend the rest of their lives searching for each other, searching for their soulmate so that they could complete each other. Come on, look at somebody and say, you complete me. How many of you heard that, something like that said before? I, I'm just looking for the one. I'm looking for someone to complete me. Have you, anybody heard that preach before that that's what God teaches? I have. Did you know it's not in the Bible? Did you know that's actually from Plato's Symposium, written in the 350 BC? Wow. 
And it's not talking about the one true God that we worship. It's talking about Zeus, who is the ultimate God of the Greek pantheon, that he created this being, and then he got angry at the being. So its punishment was is that it was going to split it in half and make it search for its wow. other part for the rest of its life. So we have bought into a lie now for thousands of years that we're missing something, that we are deficient, that we are broken, that something is messed up. But that's not what God says about you. God says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that you are the head and not the tail, that he knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. Come on, somebody. I'm ready in this 12 o'clock service. He died on a cross for you, not so that you could get to somebody else, not so that somebody else could complete you, but he died and raised again on the third day so that you would know that he loves you just as you are right now, that you don't need anybody else, that you don't have to do anything else, that you don't have to work any harder, that you can be complete in Christ. Another person will never complete you. Those of you that are wanting to get married in here, a spouse will never complete you. Only a savior will complete you. Only Jesus can complete you. So you don't have to look for the other person. And please don't believe that's what God says about the creation story. Please don't believe that that's the Bible. That's Greek mythology. But it's become such a part of the culture and such a part of what we believe, even in the church, we act like people are missing something if they're not in a relationship with another person. And I know we have a lot of single people here at Oasis, and that's why I want to just say that that is not what we're going to do, especially to our single adults, that you are not lesser than, that you are not missing something, that you don't have to be connected with someone else for God to use you, that you're not half of a whole, but God created you fully and completely in his image. So you're already complete in Christ. And I know there's already somebody in here, probably a guy in here, though, that you're thinking, but pastor, doesn't it say it's not good for man to be alone? Because <laughs> I'm lonely and I need somebody. <laughs> I can't do another Valentine's Day on my own. <laughs> I got the Chick-fil-A heart just for myself. I told him it was for my date, but it was for me. <laughs> Doesn't the Bible say that it's not good for man to be alone? It does. It does. Let's talk about that. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. If you're new to church, this is really easy to find. It's on the second page of your Bible. So real easy to find. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. This is actually what the Bible teaches about the beginning of man. It says, this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field was grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth. And I want you to circle this, highlight it, do something to mark it. And there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed life into his nostrils, the breath of life, and man became a living being. Then the Lord God planted a garden eastward to Eden, and there he put the man. Somebody say, he put the man whom he had formed. Now skip down to verse 18 just for the sake of time. You can read that when you get home, those verses. And the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. Come on, somebody. Can I get an amen from all the men in here? Some of you, is real not good for you to be alone. You need to take a shower. You need to wash your dishes. You need to wash your clothes. We know you've been wearing them same jeans for three weeks. We know. You ain't hiding it, bro. Febreze does not help. I've been there. I've been there. We know. Some of y'all, is real not good for you to be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and to them, to Adam, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. Whatever Adam was calling each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took out one of his ribs, closed up the flesh in its place, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman. And there he brought her, and the man, and Adam brought her to the man, and Adam said, this is the first Valentine's Day card right here. He was trying to get some brownie points. He said, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. I think he was doing good to that last little part right there, you know, uh, but that was the first, just this poetry, this beautiful, and then this is what you all been waiting for. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Hallelujah. And they were both naked. Can I get an amen? And the man and his wife were not ashamed. Come on. That's it right there. Hallelujah. Praise God. 
So yeah, it says that it's not good for man to be alone. But there was a lot that man had to do before the woman was introduced. Be- before there was another person brought into the equation, God gave Adam some things to do. God gave Adam a purpose, a calling. And here's the thing. It doesn't say that man wasn't good enough on his own. Right. It says that it's not good for man to be alone, but it doesn't say that he wasn't good enough. Because what most of us believe is, well, I'm not good enough. If it's not good for me to be alone, I'm a woman, I'm a man, it's not good for me alone. So that must mean that I am not good enough. But that's not what God said. God said, actually, when he created Adam, every other thing that God created, he said it was good. But when he created man, he said it was very good. When he created humankind, he said it was very good. And so when he created Adam, and again, you can take this as gender neutral. I'm just saying when he created people, he said that this was very good, that it was not missing something, that it didn't need an addition, that he didn't have to do an addendum. No, he said, this is very good, and I am going to give this person something to do. But unfortunately, we think another person will fix us. So we search our whole lives looking for someone else before we ever step into what we're called to do, before we ever step into our calling and our anointing, we look for someone else to fix our problems. It applies to all of us. We all need people. But what happens is, is we come together and we believe this lie that we are both halves and that when two halves come together, it makes a whole. But it doesn't. Because what happens when two halves come together is each of you will take from the other person to try to fill the half of you that is missing. And so you will take from the other person and they'll become a quarter instead of a half. And then they get into another relationship and now they become like an eighth instead of a quarter. Because people are taking things from them. People are taking things from you. You've taken things from other people to try to fill that brokenness inside of you, to try to fill that hole inside of you when only God can fill it. Or if we can't get what we need from that person, if they don't support us when really it should only be God that is supporting us and God that is sustaining us, if they can't support us, we'll get this bright idea and say, oh, I figured it out. They're not the one. So because they can't fill the brokenness inside of me, because they can't fill the void inside of me, which they were never supposed to do, some of us have made our spouses into our saviors, and so we are putting things on them that they were never called to do. They were never called to die for us. They were never called to be on a cross for us. Jesus already did that for us. And so what happens is we'll just, they're just not the one. So I'll leave them, and I'll go try to find another one. And we go from person to person to person, and we are pulling things from them, and we are attaching it onto ourselves, and it's never really completing us. And so what I believe in this basic series God is trying to say is he wants you to be complete in him. He wants you to be whole on your own where you don't need anybody else. And yes, we're going to talk about relationships. You need to be in community. If if you have a desire to date, if you have a desire to get married, yes, pursue that, go after it. But that shouldn't be a need. You you shouldn't think that I need to do this or I'm going to miss something. You got that? We good? Another person can never complete you. Write this down. Another person can compliment you, but they'll never complete you. Another person can compliment you, but they'll never complete you. Yes, you may have people that they compliment your personality. You know, you like, to, you like the outdoors, they like the outdoors. You like to do karaoke, they like to do karaoke. Whatever it may be, people can compliment you, but only Jesus can complete you. So there were a few things that Adam had to do before the person, before Eve, before he got into a relationship. And even if you are in a relationship today, I think we need to go back and we need to reevaluate these things in our own life. Yeah. Maybe you're in here and you're married today or you're dating or whatever the situation may be and you're like, man, I'm past this, I'm good. Are you though? Yeah. Because what I've found and our marriage counselors here at Oasis could tell you this is that a lot of things that we call married people issues are just single people issues that we take into a marriage. Oh, And so we were addicted before we got in the marriage. Why do we think that's going to change when we get in the marriage? We were manipulative before we got in the marriage. Why do we think that's going to change when we get in the marriage? So so it's not really a marriage issue. It didn't really start. Maybe it's just a me issue. 
There's a lot of people that's like, man, I just, you know, my wife, she's been, I just think we need some marriage counseling. You know, I just think we need to talk to you, Pastor. I'm like, no, I need to talk to you. <laughs> like, she's not doing anything wrong. It's you. It can be that for, for both sides of the picture, there are some things in us that we have to get fixed. It's not our spouse's issue. It's, it's our issue. We have to get healthy. We have to make sure that we're healthy and that we're whole. And so the first thing that Adam did is he had a place. Adam had a place. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden. He put him there. He had a place. God will give you a specific place. Isn't it interesting that the place came before Adam? God created the place before he created the person. So a good indication if you are in the right place or not is are you having to create the place for yourself or has God already created it for you? Because if you are trying to create a place for yourself, that probably means that God hasn't blessed it and that's not the place that God has put you in. But anytime there is blessing from God, God always prepares a place for us ahead of time. In Exodus chapter 23, verse 20, it says, Behold, I'm going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and bring you into the place which I have prepared. When Abraham was called to go away from the land of his fathers and go into a new place, it didn't just say, leave your father's land. It said, leave the Ur of the Chaldees and go to the place that I will send you. God will never just call you to leave something. He's always going to call you to something. See, I get real scared when people start talking about how they're called to leave, but God has not told them where they need to go. Because if God has called you somewhere, yes, he may call you to leave a season. He may call you to leave a city. He may call you to leave a ministry. Yes, but he will always call you to a new place. And so there are a lot of people, we just get tired of the place that we're in. When God told us to be here, and it's like, man, but that was 10 years ago, that was five years ago, that was last year, that was two weeks ago, and I'm already tired of it, and I think I'm going to go to a new place. And so we'll just leave with no direction. And so we just go out in this eternal wondering, trying to find the place when God is saying, I already prepared it for you. I'm not giving you a new place. So you can go back to the place that I've already called you, or you can just keep wondering and running from what I've prepared for you. So where has God placed you? Where has God put you? Where has he created a place for you? Because we need to stay in that place because we can think that often, we can think that when we leave a place that we're going to leave our problems. Like if, if I can leave this city and go to a new city and I can get a new friends group and I can get a new job, then everything's going to be better. Right. The only problem is, is wherever you go, there you are, you know? Right. All your problems, like you were disorganized at your old job, you're going to be disorganized at this job. <laughs> you were lazy at your old job, you're going to be lazy at this new job. You gossiped about that friend group, you're going to gossip about this friend group. And so why do we think going to a new place is going to fulfill us, is going to sustain us? God has called us to a specific place. Could it be that the reason you're not being fulfilled is you have not stayed anywhere long enough for God to develop you in that place? Because maybe it's not an immediate start. Maybe you don't get to walk into what you want to do. Maybe you just have to stay somewhere for a while and get planted somewhere for a while long enough for God to see, okay, they're going to stay there. Now I can start to use them. Now I can start to walk, walk with them and use them. Where's the last place that God puts you? You're like, you're like, I don't know what to do. I don't know where God's put me. Where's the last place that he put you? What's the last thing that God told you to do? If you haven't done the last thing that God told you to do, why are you asking for a new thing? There are so many people that's like, man, I need to hear from God. I need a word from God. Did you finish what he already told you to do? Did you complete the word that he's already given you? So you need to find a place. And I believe, and I'll just say this, that you need to be planted in a church. You need to find your place in a local church. And it doesn't have to be this church. There's so many churches in this area that we're connected with, but maybe we're not your style, your vibe. Maybe we're too loud, not loud enough, whatever it may be. But you need to be in a church. Your place needs to be found in a church. And, and a lot of times we, we laugh and make jokes about, you know, the old school, how people were at church every night of the week. And you heard that old preacher joke. I had a drug problem. I was drugged to church every day. Uh, like, I, that was me. I grew up at the church. My dad left for a revival while my mom was still in the hospital when I was just born. 
Hannah has made it emphatic that I will not be doing that. If Bishop Jakes calls me, I am not going. I better stay in that hospital or I'm not going to hear the end of it. But that was my life. And, and we look at that and we laugh and we joke. But wouldn't the place that you are known for, wouldn't you like that to be the church? Wouldn't you rather be known for being at the church than at the bar? Wouldn't you rather be known for being at the church than staying at work? Or, 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 or overworking or always being at the gym or always being at the golf course or whatever your thing may be. Yes, all those things can be good, but, but are you known for being in church? Yeah. Is this your place? Are you known for being in the house of God? And it's not just about being here on Sunday. It's not just about hearing a sermon, but it's about being a part of the family of God. Are you in this family? Are you in this community? Are you planted in the place that God has for you? So number one is place. The second one is purpose. So before Eve ever got there, Adam knew his place and he knew his purpose. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. To tend and to keep it. We say this all the time here at Oasis. We say it every next steps. We just had it this past week. We'll have it again in a couple of weeks if you want to get involved here at Oasis. But we say you were created on purpose for a purpose. No matter what your parents said about you, no matter what a teacher said about you, that you were a mistake, that you were a mess up, that you were an accident, God created you on purpose and he has a purpose for your life. That he created you to do something. It wasn't just to sit around and hang out. I think it's so hilarious when we see these pictures of Eden and Adam and Eve, they're just like chilling in the lawn chairs, you know, and they got like Bambi bringing them grapes and they're just, you know, getting the grape in their mouth and they got the, the angels fanning them. That's not what it was like. Adam was a ditch digger to tend and to keep the grounds, to dig up the ground. The verse that we read earlier said there was no man to till the ground. So he was out there with his hands, not with the John Deere, tilling the ground for the, for the trees to come up, tilling the ground for the harvest to come up. So he had a purpose, and his purpose was not found in another person. I'm going to say that again. He had a purpose, and his purpose was not found in another person. God didn't say, okay, Adam, I got a purpose for you. You're going to till this land. You're going to tend it. You're going to keep it. But just chill. Wait a second. I'm going to bring Eve. And when I bring Eve, y'all can start doing this together. No. Adam was walking in his purpose. And it wasn't until he could no longer step forward into his purpose that God brought the person. Are you awake today? He, he was walking in his purpose. He was running after God. He was doing all that he was called to do. And he did not get the person in his life until he had maximized everything that he could do on his own. He was walking in his purpose. So you can't find it in another person. And your purpose isn't to look for another spouse. I'm just called in this season to look for my man. No, you ain't. We always use these, these biblical stories uh, about these characters, and we relate them to our lives. And, and one of the most famous is, is Boaz, especially when there's any ladies talking about finding their man. I'm just looking for my Boaz. Hallelujah. You know, my man's going to take care of me. You know, he's going. Have you ever read the story of Ruth and Boaz? Ruth and Boaz, Ruth was not looking for a man. So Ruth, the situation she was in is she was married, and then her mother-in-law and father-in-law, they were all kind of this unit. They lived together, all that sort of thing. And so her father-in-law died, and her husband died. And so now you have these three women, because she also had a sister-in-law, and her husband had died. And she tells the mother-in-law says, hey, go away from me. You don't have any more commitment to me. You don't have to do anything. You're, you're released. You're no longer married. Your husband's had died. And one does leave her. One says, I'm going back home. I don't care about you, whatever. But Ruth says, no, where you go, I'll go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And so she took on the commitment of caring for her mother-in-law. And so she went out in a field and was getting not the second hand scraps, but the third hand scraps, I believe. And she was trying to find food to take care of her mother-in-law. Now, she was a single lady, especially in that culture. There wasn't a lot she could do as a single lady. So I'm sure that was on her mind. But she wouldn't walk in by Boaz like, hey, hey, notice me. You see this hair? Come on, let's get real. Walking by somebody's desk like, is he going to talk to me today? 
We'll just, I just need to get water one more time. You know, I'm real, I'm real thirsty today. I just got to get some water. No, she, she wasn't looking for the relationship. Right. And same with Boaz. Boaz wasn't looking for a wife. Yeah. If you read the story, we can see that Boaz was apparently a very successful businessman. Apparently, he had some wealth because he owned the field, and then he was in charge of some people because whatever he said, they did. And so what would have happened if neither one of them were walking in their purpose and they were just waiting around looking for the person? One, they wouldn't have accomplished what God had called them to do, but two, they would have never met each other because they only met each other when they were walking in their purpose. The other one is, I, I love with guys... Any, anybody, you're a Proverbs 31 woman. Come on, where are my ladies at? You're a Proverbs 31 woman? Dang, all right. <laughs> Y'all like, I'm going to be real. That ain't me, bro. <laughs> Is there a Proverbs 33? Because, you know, I'm a little ratchet to be a Proverbs 31, you know. <laughs> but, but I love these dudes. that be like, man, I'm just waiting for my Proverbs 31 woman. You know, she's going to be clothed in righteousness, and she's going to pray for me, and she's going to cook for me. You know, I, it's going to be great. And it's like... <laughs> But will she, though? <laughs> it's like, man, I can't wait to pray together and do devotional together. We're just going to have a great spiritual life. And it's like, but do you do a devotional by yourself? Because a lot of times we're looking for the other person to complete us. And, man, if I can just get with that other person that's holy, and if I can just get with that other person that's got their life together, and if I can get that with that other person that's got a job, it's going to all rub off on me. I don't know. Because if you ever read about a Proverbs 31 woman, it says that she woke up before it was light outside to provide for her family. Yeah. It says that she was a real estate investor and she bought some land and then made a profit on it and yeah. turned it into a vineyard and started a business with the profit she had created. Right. And you ain't even got a job. Right. <laughs> so dudes out here like, Proverbs 31 woman, that's going to be my lady. And it's like, no, like she working and you on Xbox. <laughs> like... Man, I can't even lie. I play Xbox a lot, so no hate. But, but this is how we are. We, we think, man, I'm just, I'm gonna just sit around and I'm gonna just wait for the person, and I'm not gonna walk in my purpose. I'm not gonna walk in what God's called me to do. I'm not gonna get educated. I'm not gonna put out my resume. I'm not gonna do. I'm just gonna wait for the person to complete me. But that's not what it teaches. It says that you're complete in Christ. You can write this down. It says purpose-filled people attract purpose-filled people. You will attract who you are, not what you want. So I know you want somebody that's got a six-pack and is tan, but you ain't even got a gym membership. <laughs> and I know we're joking, but, but, but let's look at it, man. We, we want somebody that's spiritually strong. We, we want someone that can raise our family to follow after God. But when's the last time we cracked open our Bible app? Well, when's the last time we put our faith in God with our finances? Amen. When's the last time we said, I am more concerned about my purpose and what God has called me to do than anything that is happening around me? Because that's the type of person that we want, but is that who we are? Because we will attract who we are, not what we want. Amen. So make sure that you are being that person, that purpose-filled person. And so after we find the place, after you find your purpose, then we can start talking about the person. And I know I was going to talk about relationships, but really it's not so much about relationships. It's really about you. Because I think if you can figure out your place and your purpose and get secure in Christ, everything else will work itself out. I even think about my wife and I's story. I was reminiscing last night. We went to uh, her brother's wedding and uh, it's crazy the way that we got connected because I went to be a youth pastor at a smaller, uh, smaller church in Victoria, Texas, which I'd never been there before, never really been to the church before, uh, didn't really know a whole lot about it. And I went to be a youth pastor there for just a couple months. And at the same time, she was working at another church, but her family attended that church. And we just kind of happened to meet like a few times and like didn't get each other's numbers, didn't talk, didn't hang out. Not one of those Christian like, let's go get coffee and talk about the Lord. You know, well, I didn't pull one of those. None of the, no, no, no. We were focused on our purpose. And, and, and we didn't reconnect until several years later. She was living in Australia when we connected. I was living back here in Austin. There, there's no way that it makes sense. And so many of us, we're trying to force it to make sense. 
Okay, this is the person I want, so I'm going to adapt my purpose and my place to fit that person. I'm going to allow the person to dictate where I live and where I go. And, you know, I know I'm called to be in Round Rock. I know I'm called to be in Austin, but I met this dude and he looked real good and he lives in New York. And so I feel the Lord just leading me to New York. Hallelujah. (laughs) Do you or are you just placing the person ahead of your purpose and the place that God has called you to? Because if you put the person first, it's going to begin to manipulate and move and twist and change what you are really called to do. And you'll start making excuses and you'll start saying, well, you know, I thought I was called to this, but, you know, I really kind of think God's calling me to this over here. No, no, no. Is it because you're called to that or is it just because of the person? Is it just because you're attracted to them? Is it because you've gotten connected with them? Is it because you think they'll complete you? That that hurt that you've been carrying for years and years, that hurt that you've been carrying from your childhood, is it that you think when you finally get connected with them that they're going to fulfill that? No, you have to put the place first, then the purpose, then the person. We can't be tearing each other down because what happens so oftentimes, like I said earlier, that when we're two halves, we begin to tear each other down. I'm going to take from you to what makes me feel better. I'm going to put you down because it makes me feel better. I, I'm going to make fun of you because I have that insecurity. And I know if I call out, if you have that insecurity and you're more insecure than me, then it's going to make me look good. And that seems so petty. It seems so small, but it happens in relationships every single day. Even, and even in friendships. And when I say the person, I'm not just talking about romantic relationships. There are some of you in here, you just need a person to be a friend. You just need to be a, a, have a person that can be in relationship with you. Because why do you think that you're going to let your spouse correct you if you've never let a friend correct you? Why do you think you'll be accountable to your spouse if you've never been accountable to a spiritual leader? So you need some friends in your life that, yes, they can encourage you. They can lift you up. They can pump you up. They can tell you how great you are, but they can also correct you. They can also admonish you. They can also hold you accountable to the things that are going on in your life. So some of you, the person isn't a romantic relationship. It's not someone of the opposite sex. It's actually someone that you just need to begin to walk beside as a friend. And like the Bible says, you need to love them as you love yourself. I think that's what has messed us up so much in the church is we jump straight to the romantic side. Like we don't want to be friends anymore. It's just straight to romance. Instead of saying, no, I've got some friends and and I'm going to make sure I'm good on that level before I step to the next level. I'm going to make sure that I can love a friend before I I try to love a spouse. I'm going to make sure that I can love a friend before I can love my children. I'm going to make sure that I can try to love someone else and not make it all about me. Because that's really what we're saying when we say you complete me. It's all about me. It's all about me being completed. I don't really care how it makes you feel as long as it completes me.